Welcome to the penultimate video for four for five on conditional probability for A-level Edexcel maths. So we've had a look at different regions of Venn diagrams and conditional probabilities and A given B, B given A, and now I'm going to derive and then use some formulas which will make this work even easier for us as we go along to some deeper questions. So let's now have a look together at some warm-up questions to get us started. As you can probably guess, there's four to have a go at, but normally always is. Press pause now and try these on your own. And when you're ready to see the solutions, press play and I'll guide you through them. And with a bit of luck, they'll make sense and you will have got the same conclusions as myself. OK, so without going on any longer, let's have a look together at question number one. So question number one, a student was asked to solve these simultaneous equations and the students attempted it. Line one, two, three, four, five, got some solutions. However, it says here the students made an error on line three. So we can just zoom in on line three because this is where we know the error is and also line two above so we can try and spot the error as we go from line two to line three so the error is in line three so we can actually assume nicely that line two is pretty watertight so we don't need to do all of it ourselves so line two let's assume this is right because it says the error is on line three we have an x squared here we've got an x squared there that seems reasonable Expand out the brackets, minus 3x times 9 will be minus 27x. That's what they've put here. However, minus 3x multiplied by another minus x, a minus value multiplied by another minus value should give us a positive. Minus 3x times positive x would give us positive 3x squared, not negative. So this here is actually the error. So we need to write this down. So identify the error in line 3. Uh, the student should have written or should have put positive 3x squared, certainly not minus 3x squared. So that's the main thing to write there. Should be a plus, but it was a minus. An easy mistake to make, so well done if you spotted that one. Question two, using algebra and showing all your working, this is important, solve the simultaneous equations. So we can actually use part of the question from before to help us. So rather than doing it all ourselves, my tip and suggestion would be to start with the corrected line three from question one as a starting point. So if I go back to line one, that's what we had with plus three X instead of the minus. So this has now been corrected. We can now group together like terms. So X squared, plus 3x squared plus another 2x squared that would give us 6x squared overall then next the x's we've got minus 27 here and take away another 36 so if you take away 27 of something then take away another 36 you're taking away 63x in total finally the number on its own is just plus 62 so we say plus 62 equals zero it does say, however, use algebra and show all your working. So we can't just get away with using the class whiz. We need to show some algebra. This would actually factorise, believe it or not. I don't think that's easy. Um, so what I would suggest is using the quadratic formula. So x equals minus b plus or minus the root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Then we need to remember a is the coefficient of the x squared term so our a is 6 b we need to remember is the number in front of the x's which is minus 63 not 63 but minus 63 be very very careful and finally the c is the number on its own at the end which is positive 62 so we can plug these values in so minus b means minus minus 63 I'm writing it in full so you can see why it's a plus 63. And plus or minus the square root of b squared. b, again, of course, is minus 63. So that all squared. Minus 4 times a, which was 6, times by c at the end, which was positive 162. A bit of a faff, bit of work, but it's, it's doable. We're doing it all over 2 times a where a, of course, is 6. So we plug these numbers in. Remember the plus and the minus options. And then we just double check on the class quiz using a calculator as a checking tool. So 
minus minus 63. If you want to, you can just say plus 63, but if in doubt, use your calculator exactly as you wish. So plus the square root of minus 63 all squared, and it was minus 4 times A, which was 6, times C, which was 162, and all of that is all over 2A, which is 2 times 6. Press equals. Our first solution is that X is 6. So x equals 6, or second solution, press equals again, we get x equals, oops, press again, what am I doing? There we go, x is 6. But if we toggle and make the plus into a minus, using the formula, because obviously it's plus or minus, so go back, delete that, put it into minus, x is 4.5. However, we do need to work out y as well. So x add y is 9. So if x is 6, the other y would be 3, because 6 plus 3 gives us 9. Or if x is 4.5, y would have to be 4.5 as well, because 4.5 plus 4.5 gives 9. So these are the full, full solutions. Either x is 6, y is 3, or the other pair, x and y, are both 4.5. In terms of checking this on your calculator, I'll just very quickly show you how to do that. We go onto the calculator, menu screen, type menu, then scroll along or press option A, get to option A, which is equation slash func for functions, press 1. Sorry, what am I talking about? Blunder, 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 my bad. I mean press equals, what am I talking about? Simultaneous equation is what we were doing, but actually, what we could do here, we can skip to this step, trusting our answer to question 1. So go to polynomial degree 2, and then we can type in this. So 6x squared minus 63x's, then type in plus 162, then press equals and equals again. Our first answer for x is 6, which if you see here we got, press equals again. The second value of x is 4.5. Then we do the rest to work out the y, but we can do that. We're good enough, I'm sure. Next up, we have question 3. Question three is about kinematics, acceleration and particles. So a car moves from traffic lights along a straight road with constant acceleration. The car starts from rest at traffic lights and 60 seconds later, it passes a speed camera at 90 kilometers per hour. What you need to find first is the acceleration of the car. Now, because it mentions constant acceleration, alarm bell should be going off. This is going to be SUVAT. So a SUVAT question, you need to remember these equations ideally. You are given them in fairness, but it's not a problem to remember them. And then here, S, U, V, A, and T to be populated with what we know. So what do we know? Well, we know that the time period is 60 seconds. So T we can say is 60. A is what we're trying to find. So the acceleration, I'm gonna put a question mark because although we don't know it, we're interested in knowing that. And we're also told it starts from rest. So if something starts from rest, that's a way of indirectly saying that the initial velocity is zero. Now, the weird curveball which has been given here is the speed at which it passes this speed camera. It's been given not in meters per second, which we need it in, but in 90 kilometers per hour. So let's just convert this into the right units. So let's change from kilometers per hour to meters per hour. So how many meters per hour would it be? Well, how many meters makes a kilometer? Well, there's a thousand meters in each kilometer. So what we could do here is multiply by a thousand to work out what that would be in terms of meters per hour. So 90 times a thousand, I'm hoping you agree, is 90,000. Use your calculator if you don't agree, that's fine. And then finally, to change from the hour units into second units, we need to be thinking how many seconds makes an hour. Obviously, we can't do 90,000 meters in, in just one second, so the distance covered in a second is going to be less, of course, than the distance covered in an hour. That's just a little reminder to tell us we need to be dividing, not timesing, to convert this unit properly. 60 seconds in a minute and 60 of those minutes in an hour, so we need to divide by 60 squared, or we can divide by 3,000. 600. It's the same difference. 
for 60 squared is 3,600. So this one here, we're going to take 90,000 and divide it by 60 squared or 3,600 if you'd prefer. It's absolutely fine. We get 25. So in kilometers, sorry, in meters per second, we've got 25 meters per second, which is what we need. So 90 kilometers per hour in better units is 25 meters per second. So that's our final velocity when it passes this speed camera. We want to find the acceleration. We don't know S for displacement, nor do we actually really care for question three. So we need a SUVA equation which ignores S altogether and just involves U, V, A and T. So I'm hoping you can see here, it's actually going to be A. So A, acceleration, which is what we want, is V minus U over T. The final velocity was 25. Initial velocity was zero, because it starts from rest, it said. All divided by the time period, which is 60 seconds. And that's what we're going to type in on our calculator. 25 over 60, essentially. So 25 over 60. There's an exact fraction is 5 over 12. Normally in stats and kinematics and mechanics, we do it in decimals, usually, not always. But as a decimal approximation, it's 0.417 meters per second squared, 0.417. So that's the answer for number three. And what we could do, just to convince the examiner we know exactly what we're doing, I'd probably suggest putting in brackets, that's to three significant figures, Mr. or Mrs. Examiner, or Miss Examiner. Um, question four, we can use this acceleration value here as well. So for question four, now, based on the same context, we need to work out the distance between the traffic lights and this speed camera. Again, it's still going to be SUVAT, so we can still wheel out the same thing here. So S, U, V, A and T, some of which we'll know from question three, of course. This time, we want to find the distance between the traffic lights and the speed camera. That's what we want to know. Now we do want to know the displacement. From before, remember it did start from rest. So initial velocity is zero. Final velocity from question three, we had that the final velocity was 90 kilometers per hour, which in proper units is 25 meters per second. And of course, we're told it takes 60 seconds to actually get up to that speed. At this point, we can either use the A acceleration we got from question three, that's fine as well. Or we could choose to ignore it and just use what we have here. With SUVAT equations, we need three knowns plus the one unknown, obviously. We don't need four unknowns, but we do need, sorry, we need at least three knowns. So we have that, it's fine. So which one of these does not need um, the one we don't know, which is A? Which one of these doesn't involve an A? That one does, so no, no, no. However, here, S, this one, is what we're going to go for. So that's our winning ticket. So therefore, S is half of the average, if you like, of U plus V. So half of 0 plus 25, which I know you know is 25. I'm just writing it out in full so you can see where it all comes from. And that multiplied by T, which is 60. So we just compute that on our calculation machines, otherwise known as a calculator. And we should hopefully get the correct solution. So what we had, just switch this around slightly so we can see what we're doing. So it's one half of zero plus 25 times by 60 gives us an answer of 750 meters. So three quarters of a kilometer in a minute if you're in a car. Always be thinking, is my answer reasonable? That is actually possible. That is reasonable. A car can do three quarters of a kilometre in a minute, that is feasible. If you had 750 kilometres in 60 seconds, be thinking of a made a mistake, but that is fine, that is the correct solution. So let's have a look now at the main body of today's lesson. Addition formulae and multiplication formula for conditional probability. So like I said, there are two formulae we can derive and then use that relate to events. 
which is going to be about intersections and unions. So like two events, let's call them A and B, and it's going to link to their intersections and unions. So first off, let's start by calling the events A and B. Let little a represent the total number of elements, number of things in A. Let little b represent the total number of elements in B. And I, which is going to stand for intersection, represent the total number of elements in the intersection of A and B, which using set notation is A union, sorry, A intersection with B, not union intersection. So these are the, form, these are the uh, diagrams you're going to use. Addition formula for this one, multiplication formula this one. So we're going to start off identical then we're going to diverge and prove different things on this diagram to that one. So first of all, like I would say to all students, always start with labeling the intersection first. So I've said here, let's call I the things in the intersection. So the intersection, A intersect B, is where the circles overlap. So we've got I elements there, so label in I first of all. So next, in A, there needs to be a elements in total. Now because I is already in the overlap, which is including A, we need to exclude I. So if I just put a red circle over circle A to highlight it, we can think of this in a bit more clarity. So in total, in the red, needs to be a total of A. If I stick an A here, then in total in red I'd have A plus I. But the total number of elements in A is just little a, nothing to do with i. So what I need to put here is a minus i, so that when I combine them, a minus an i plus an i, this cancels just to give us a in circle big A, which is exactly what we need. Similar for circle B, so what we said for circle B is let little b represent the total number of elements in big circle B. So if I colour over black circle B in blue, it's pretty much the same deal we discussed for the red circle big A. In total, the number of elements in this blue circle needs to be little b. But I've already got i here. I don't want anything in terms of i. I want it just to be one little b. So what needs to go here in just the b region is b minus i. So that when you add them together in the blue circle, i plus b minus i, the i's cancel, now we're just left with little b number of things in circle b, which is how we define the problem. So now it all works. So let's be thinking of this addition formula. So let's be thinking, first of all, of what the union of a and b is. So a unified with b is everything in circles a, b, and the intersection. So it's a minus i, which is just in the red, plus the i in the middle, in the intersection. I'll call code that in yellow so you can see where it's coming from, so the i's aren't going to get confused. Then finally, plus b minus i. So if I combine all of this together, I've got a plus b, which is obviously just a plus b. Now I've got an i here, but I'm taking away an i over there, and I'm also taking away an i over here. So a unified with b is actually going to be a total of a plus b minus i. Let's just think about this in slightly more detail. What did we say little a was? Well, we said little a um, represented um, everything in circle a. Okay, so what this is here that's in all the things in A, A is going to represent PA, and B is going to represent the probability of what's in B, and I is the intersection. So from that we can then say we can take away what's in the intersection, which is A intersect B. So what we've said here essentially is that A unified with B is all of A plus all of B minus the intersection. So putting it in a nice way, using the probability notation, the probability of an event being in the intersection, so a probability of an event being in the union, A union B, is a probability of A plus probability of B, but then we need to minus off the probability of A and B. Because if we do probability of A plus a probability of B, 
we will have double counted the intersection. That's why I need to take away one lot of the intersection. The multiplication formula next. So what we need to think about here is the probability of B given that A's been selected. So what's the probability of B given A? Now we touched upon this last lesson. Probability of B given A. This is how I'd start it off. What this means is we're told for definite that the element we're selecting is in the red circle A. And what's the chance of selecting something which is also in B given that we're picking from the red circle only? So if we're picking from the red circle, I can just essentially ignore everything but the red circle. So if I just take away what isn't in the red, this bit of the B circle, I'm left with just what's inside circle A. So if it's inside circle A, then the chance of picking an element in B is just the bit of A, which also coincides with circle B, which is this bit here, which is the intersection. So the intersection, um, the chance of that being selected would be the probability of intersection, which in set notation is A unified with B, all over the overall probability of A. So it's basically that proportion, that tiny fraction of the whole of A we'd be looking at. That's the chance of picking something in B, given that it's in A. That tiny fraction of A would have to be selected. That fraction of big A is P, A, intersection of B, and the full circle A is just simply A. Now, A intersect with B is the same as B intersecting with A. So what we can do here, we can rearrange this formula by times in both sides by P, A, so then what we get here is probability of A and B is a probability of B given A times by the probability of A. Writing it in a slightly different way, but completely equivalent, we have this result here. Probability of B intersecting with A, which is the same as probability of A intersecting with B, either or really, is a probability of B given A multiplied by the probability of A. That's called the multiplication formula. Whichever way you want to remember it, as long as you can remember it, is fine. I personally think of it as a fraction of the total circle. The chance of it being in B has to be where it's in the intersection as a total fraction of all of circle A. But if you think of it like this and this makes more sense to you and is more memorable, try and remember that formula as well. But you do need to remember either what I've highlighted in blue or what I've put here in bold. So now we've derived them, let's use them. So work to example one, we have A and B, which are two events such that the probability of A is 0 0.6, the probability of B is 0 0.7, and the probability of an element being selected which is in the union of A and B is 0 0.9. Based on this information, we need to find the probability of um, an element being in the intersection of A and B. Now this is where, without using the formula, this would just be a mind blower. But with the formula, particularly this one, I mean to say, the addition formula, this is actually, weirdly, very, very simple indeed, as long as you can remember this, of course. It's just a case of plugging in the values now. So what is A unified with B as a probability? But well, we're told that's 0 0.9. So 0 0.9 must equal probability of A. Well, that's 0 0.6 plus for probability of B, that was 0 0.7, minus the probability of A intersecting with B, which is ultimately what we're wanting to find. So let's neaten up and rearrange and solve. So if we have 0 0.9, 0 0.6 plus 0 0.7 is 1.3, minus P, A, unified with B. You can then now rearrange it or just solve by inspection really. 0 0.9 equals 1.3 take away what? Well 1.3 take away 0 0.4 gives us 0 0.9. So therefore I'm just going to go straight to it and say therefore probability of an element being in the intersection of A and B is going to be 1.3 minus 0 0.9 which is 0 0.4. That's a fairly simple example to get us kicked off. Let's now have a look at an exam paper question. 
So, like I said, worked example two, this is an exam style example. A and B are two events such that the probability of B is a half, the probability of A given B is two fifths, and the probability of something being in the union of A and B is 13 over 20. First of all, we need to find the probability of A intersecting with B. So this is one way we could use a multiplication formula, but I think of it as the fraction formula personally. I think of it like this, um, basically the probability of A given that something's in B, the only way that it could be A, if I'm told that it's definitely in B, is if the part of B that's selected is also intersecting with A. So that can only happen if I pick something which is in the intersection of A and B, which is actually what I'm wanting to find. So it's that chance only out of a total possibility of everything that could be selected. So if we're given that we're picking B, it's that fraction out of the whole of event B. So now if we rearrange this, we can get P, A intersecting with B as the subject by multiplying both sides of this by P, B. So times both sides by P, B. We therefore see probability of A intersecting with B is the probability of A given B times by the probability of B. So the probability of A given B, we're told here is two fifths, so we can write this one in. Then we're going to multiply that by the probability of B itself. Probability of B is a half. So two fifths multiplied by a half, that gives us one fifth. So the answer to part A is simply one fifth. Just using the information we've been given. Uh, part B, draw a Venn diagram to show the events A, B and all the other associated probabilities. So there's event A, there's event B and the intersection of course. So we've just worked out the intersection is one fifth. So we can fill in one fifth straight away. However, the probability of B is a half. So all of a circle B needs to add up to a half. I've already got a fifth, so what must go in here must be a half minus that fifth. So let's just calculate that. So one half minus a fifth. You may as well use a calculator, you've got one, and it's a calculator paper, as we all are. A half minus a fifth is three tenths. So over here, for just a bit of B on its own is three tenths. Next, we're told the union of A and B, the probability of that is 13 over 20. So everything in these binoculars, this binocular sort of shape, it needs to add up to 13 over 20. I've got one fifth and three tenths already, so the remainder going here must be 13 over 20 minus these two values. So let's do that. So 13 over 20. Then from that, I'm going to take away the, was it one fifth? It was, I'm going to take away one fifth. I'm going to take away as well the three tenths. And what we get from that one is dum dum dum, three over 20. So three over 20 chance is just in A. And don't forget the number on the outside. All the values in the Venn diagram need to add up to one. So let's see what these add up to first. Then we do one subtract that. Or, of course, we can just use this if you want it to be a bit quicker and savvier. A unified over B is 13 over 20, so everything inside the circles is 13 over 20. Therefore, on the other outside must be the other 7 out of 20. 13 over 20 plus 7 over 20 gives us a full whole unit, which is what it needs to be. For part C, we need to work out the probability of event A. Well, the probability of event A is everything inside circle A, which is 3 over 20 and that fifth. So 3 twentieths plus 1 fifth. If you want to try that on your calculator, by all means, just for speed, I'm just going to tell you, and try if you don't believe me, that's 7 over 20. You could actually, or should be able to do it without a calculator anyway, but you know, you might have gone rusty and overly reliant in your A-level days 
the mental deficit may have gone downhill. Mine actually did when I did my A-levels because I just use a calculator a lot. So especially at university as well. Anyway, I digress. This one, D, probability of B given A. So again, we can use the similar formula to what we used for part A. Probability of B given A, if we're told it's in circle A, when we want the probability of B being selected, the only way that can happen is if we're picking the intersection of A and B, or B and A if you want to write B intersection A, makes no odds. But because we're given that we're picking circle A, it's therefore over the probability of A. So the intersection of A and B, we can see here, that's a fifth, so it's one fifth, divided by the probability of A, which we worked out from question part C, that was seven twentieths. So it's one fifth divided by seven twentieths. One fraction divided by another, essentially. Your calculator can handle that, which is good news. I'll show you how. You should probably, you probably do know how, but can't hurt for me to show you. Press the fraction button. Fill up the numerator, press fraction again. One fifth. Then scroll to the denominator, press the fraction button again to get a fraction within a fraction. 7 over 20 on the bottom, press equals, and we have 4 over 7. And the last part to this one, part A, what's the probability of A dashed intersecting with B? Well, if it's not in A, that means A dashed, so I can ignore everything to do with circle A. So everything to do with circle A, I'm going to take out. That was in circle A. Now that one fifth was also part of circle A, so I need to get rid of that as well. So where does um, the bit that isn't A intersect with B as well? Where can we see something that isn't in A but is also in B. Well, 7 twentieths is in neither A or B. The only thing that isn't in A but is in B is at 3 tenths. So therefore, for E, we've just got 3 tenths. You can put 0 0.3 if you really wanted. That's absolutely fine. That's all the questions done. So now it's over for you to try some and get the practice up and running. So now, if you can turn to page 25 in your Stats and Mechanics Year 2 books, exercise 2D, my suggestion would be to try questions 1, 2 and 4, and then the exam type questions 9, 10, 11 and 12 later on in that exercise. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you found some of it useful. I don't expect you've watched the whole thing, but there you go. Um, and do please let me know, either in the comments or in lesson, if you're still stuck or struggling or unsure. As I say, once again, thank you very much, and I hope to see you all soon. So goodbye from me for now.